talk is going to focus more on the culture of, um, of, of brain research and focus more on middle class women, although I'd certainly be happy to talk to people later about the kinds of things that are happening in Canada with regard to this. And it has more to do with targeting, uh, like, like this, targeting low income families, but it, it's a move away from universal kinds of services like public health nurse visits after, at least in Ontario, um, public health nurse visits after uh, a baby's born for educational and support services uh, purposes um, to more of them being income tested and only provided to poor and disadvantaged and targeted families, which of course then makes them much more a form of surveillance <coughs> rather than, than support. At any rate, I'm, I'm going to talk uh, more about the culture of, of uh, brain science and uh, how it played out in my interviews with middle class mothers. I have throughout the last eight years been involved in examining both the discourse that surrounds early year brain development advice and the media hype in Canada, as well as uh, mothers' experiences with this discourse. There's no doubt um, that the kind of child-centered intensive parenting that Sharon Hayes described has intensified with the addition of so-called new brain research and that the standards of good parenting and good mothering have been ramped way up in a way that meshes with neoliberal rationality of individual responsibility and self-management. In 2004, I interviewed 14 mainly middle-class, all well-educated mothers of preschoolers about their experiences with the um, early years brain development research and advice. Um, what I found were stressed, anxious, exhausted parents who were desperate for more time, both more time to spend with their children, and in this respect, they were desperate for more unrushed, non-stressed time, um, as well as some more time for themselves. Uh, these were people who were, for the most part, working mothers, and they really felt themselves pushed to the brink in terms of the dual demands of work and intensive parenting, and found that it was affecting their, their mental and their physical health, and were starting to push back a bit. Um, so on some level, the desire for more time for themselves can be seen as resistance to the exclusively child-centered aspect of this advice. However, this resistance also came with large helpings of guilt for these women, in part because they didn't question their ability to control their children's cognitive outcomes, nor their responsibility to do all that they could to ensure that this happened. Um, I wanted to sort of move, first of all, to talk about the language of, of brain science, because I really do think it casts parents as, as engineers and programmers who can shape the design of their children's brains in order to get the most out of them. Um, this is, um, these, you've probably seen this, uh, this publication, perhaps not, it's from the Reiner Foundation, which John Brewer um, criti critiques in, in his book. Um, but it's also uh, information that's widely distributed to new parents in Canada and has been since the late 1990s um, through the Canadian Institute of Child Health. So you can see there the talks about synapses, about neurons, um, I like that uh, phrase, appropriate activation. That's what parents do, is they activate synapses uh, appropriately. Um, and, you know, the, the talk that, that these affect the way that children's brains become wired. This is, uh, these are quotes from a Canadian um, publication called Parenting with the Zap Family. And the Zap Family uh, was widely seen on CBC morning television children's programming for quite a while in the, in the 90s, late 90s. Um, the Zap refers to zapping the synapses. Um, so we have people, uh, these are some quotes from, from a parent handbook that they put out. Uh, these are good experiences with people in stimulating activities that zap brain connections into place. It's called brain wiring, and you and your child do it together. And we can see that the wiring can be good or bad, um, depending on, on what parents do. So really, um, in this language, it's a language of, of shaping, wiring, activating neurons, making the right connections. And in these scenarios, parents are the engineers who provide the proper inputs and make the necessary connections by being continually responsive to children's cues and providing much one-on-one -on -one attention and time spent reading, singing, talking, reasoning, and playing. As a result, children's brain potential, and it is implied, their future intelligence grows. Um, and children's brains then are portrayed as machines that parents can literally build and shape so long as they are willing to devote unlimited time, energy, and patience to the task. 
Children, as many researchers, um, including Frank Ferretti, have pointed out, are positioned in this discourse as vulnerable, passive, lacking in agency, and autonomy. Uh, the amount of control that parents are seen as having over child outcomes, on the other hand, is remarkable. And as we have seen in particular in both the United States and now in Britain, proponents of this advice envision all manner of social ills being solved and national prosperity and success increasing simply, as Ellie pointed out, by taking steps to increase the neural connections made in children's brains in the early years of life. Also remarkable, I thought, was the widespread acceptance among mothers that I interviewed of their ability to control their children's cognitive outcomes. Most of these mothers did not question their ability to improve their children's intelligence or their responsibility, as I said, to provide increasingly intensive parenting to ensure that this happened. And I'm just going to give you a few quotes um, from the mothers that, that I talked to, to to give you a sense of the, the sort of assuredness of, that they had, that, that, they did have, that they did have this control. So here's Sarah. She says, I'm constantly aware that everything I do affects how their brains are going to develop. So how I talk to them, whether or not I respond right away or wait a few minutes, whether or not I'm tuned to their cues and their different cries and what is happening with them emotionally as well as physically. I'm constantly questioning what kind of impact my parenting is having on their development. Um, a couple of more quotes here. Uh, Jennifer, uh, who says, he is our focus on everything. We just got his report card from daycare. He's a three-year-old. <laughs> Um, and I will tell you that it shows because his report card was, I started to cry because it was phenomenal. We work hard at it. Um, and Tara, who was a very intensive mother, um, says, you know, and you get that sense in there, you have to balance things, weigh things, weigh everything, you have to read, you have to be sensitive to every single thing they do, their body language, you are completely responsible for a life that is going to go somewhere after you are done doing your parenting thing. You have to be 100% on the game at all times, so, and, I, and I like this. And you have to love doing it, because <laughs> if you don't, they know. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, it wasn't just my study. I've read a lot of other similar studies of intensive parenting, Annette LaRoe's work, um, Virginia Caputo's work, um, and, and others. And I'm, I'm struck when reading their work, again, um, with the middle-class mothers they interview the assumption, again, that they have such a great deal of control over their child's cognitive outcomes. And this led me to the questions that I, I want to talk about today. And um, again, what's, what's happening in our culture that, that this is so widely accepted, both on an individual and cultural level? So why is this positioning of mothers as all-powerful and children as so totally lacking in agency and autonomy currently so widely accepted on both a cultural and individual level? And what is the cultural context that allows such an unquestioning assumption of control over child cognitive outcomes? Now, of course, there's many, <coughs> many things. It's very complex, as, as, uh, as we've been told. And uh, there's many things that are involved. I'm going to talk about a few of them, um, a few of the more obvious ones, I think. And certainly, the authority of science experts and the state has a lot to do with, with uh, why this occurs. Brain development advice has, of course, the authority of science behind it. And this authority is an important part of why assumptions about good motherhood and the nature of childhood are so uncritically accepted. In much of the literature, claims, <coughs> much of the literature claims are presented as scientific fact. And the phrase, research tells us, simply uh, prefaces the advice. It is, in fact, um, as other people have said too, reminiscent of the, in many ways of the scientific mothering of the early 20th century, at least in its assumption of children as malleable products of scientific parenting methods. That government educators and child welfare authorities also design policy and programs based on an uncritical acceptance of this science also helps to explain the individual and cultural acceptance of this acceptance of maternal control. Certainly, the mothers I talked to took for granted that the claims made in early years research um, the, in the promotional material. They viewed them as obvious, if somewhat unremarkable, truths. Now, again, as many people have alluded to, and I'd really be happy to talk more to, uh, with people one-on-one on one about this, but this advice certainly builds on a long history of the science of attachment. And in order to understand it and why it is so widely accepted, that needs to be understood as well. Um, and, and 
Yeah. I, again, I'd be happy to talk about attachment, but it, 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 I, I'm constantly amazed at how uncritically it is accepted um, and continues, uh, how influential it continues to be. But certainly originally, Bowlby built, um, Bowlby built in the 1950s um, this attachment theory based on his highly gendered notion of maternal deprivation and positioned mothers as almost, excuse me, solely responsible for children's emotional and social development and future mental health. Bowlby's attachment theory was also based in part on findings from animal studies and studies of severe deprivation. And um, certainly, as, as uh, John Burr and, and other people point out, linking animal and human behavior is highly problematic, as is the assumption that if severe deprivation has severe consequences, then any separation from a primary caregiver will, um, will also have negative consequences. Subsequent studies also showed that children in daycare did not display attachment problems and that early attachment measures did not necessarily predict a child's later behavior, surprise, surprise, especially if child-rearing child conditions changed in the interim. Nevertheless, attachment theory retained a very important and influential position in, the devel in developmental psychology and does to this day, and it does underlie the, the brain development advice. It is based upon, the, the brain development advice is based upon it. Now, the science behind current brain development advice is also far from convincing, as uh, John Brewer and others point out. Nevertheless, critiques of it receive very little attention in the media or in advice, in advice research. And here, I really concur with Diane Iyer in her critique of, of the bonding and attachment um, research that, um, that some scientific findings are much uh, more quickly accepted than others not because of they are scientifically convincing, um, but rather because they fit into deeply embedded ideologies of the time. And the ideologies Ira was referring to are ones about the place of women and mothers in society. And these ideologies are important in understanding the appeal of, of brain development advice as well. So that's sort of my second category of, of uh, cultural influences is the, the whole uh, uh, section of gender and accountability. And uh, as Aaron Reich in English and other historians, um, along with other, many other feminist scholars have pointed out, we have a long history of blaming mothers for the social ills of society. Concepts such as maternal deprivation and maternal overprotection, which pathologized motherhood in the mid 20th century, were also based on the assumption that mothers wielded an immense amount of control over child outcomes and thus social problems. Um, Freudian analysis, pop psychology of the 70s and 80s, um, the self-help movement also reinforce the idea that we are what our parents and especially what our mothers have made us. At the root of many of these concepts was the ideology of natural motherhood, the idea that maternal love and self-sacrifice are on some level biological and that mothers possess maternal instincts which naturally make them better suited to parenting. Certainly, I'm, I mean, when we talk about whether we still believe in maternal instinct or not, I'll tell you my students do. Um, uh, my, my undergraduate students very strongly accept that that is true, that mothers have something that fathers don't have that's biological, that makes them better, loving, more nurturing parents. Um, such understandings, I think, are still ubiquitous and deeply embedded in collective subjectivity. A good mother is a self-sacrificing mother who puts her children first, and mothers are held to account far more than fathers for children's physical and emotional well-being, as well as their behavioral and cognitive outcomes. So people act in these ways. Oh. I'll just stay there for a minute. People do gender in Weston Zimmerman's sense of the concept, in part because they are held accountable and judged based on gendered expectations. The fact that child outcomes are positioned by governments and professional agencies as public issues and social problems increases the accountability that mothers face in this regard enormously. It means that mothering behavior becomes something that everyone has a stake in and can weigh in on. Child outcomes become a public responsibility and a public issue. Um, and moral, moral authority to judge and scrutinize mothers is extended to everyone. That mothers in my study were cognizant of this accountability 
uh, came through clearly in their descriptions of the competitive situations they found themselves in vis-a-vis -vis other mothers, as well as their own descriptions of ideal motherhood as selfless and self-sacrificing. Wendy, for instance, when talking about the expectations that parents face today, noted, you're supposed to nurture this building, being and it's so important to do it right and make sure they grow up and that they are as smart as they could possibly be and they, are, they do something important with their life. Similarly, Alicia notes, the pressure is there just by the way that parents talk. I try to resist it as much as possible and do what my husband and I think is best. For example, I used to take my daughter once a year to a theater production, but that was because I liked that and I wanted to be exposed to it, or music and things like that. So I try not to succumb to the pressure, but it's true. The way people talk about it, if you don't do all these activities with your kids, you feel guilty about it. And in a similar vein, we see Jessica who says, I feel there's this cycle of your kid has got to be signed up for this or that. I think it's pressure from parents that we do to ourselves that we allow in. I feel like we're creating a kind of higher expectation level of what we need to be doing to be a good parent. It's a cycle we're in, and I don't know, it just isn't supportive. And then there's Tara, again, our extremely intensive mother, who notes, when asked how she would define a good mother, she says, putting your child totally before yourself. When you become a parent, you are no longer a person. <laughs> um, Deeply rooted gender ideologies that mothers are held accountable to form an important part of the cultural context that positions mothers as powerful cognitive engineers. There are other discourses as well, though, that intersect with and support this notion of maternal control over children's intellectual success. And the one that I'm most interested in is the whole uh, notion of risk, planning, and, and choice, <coughs> and what... what uh, what our culture, the, the risk culture that we live in, um, and the neoliberal culture that we live in, tells us about what we can do. We live in a neoliberal world where risk and uncertainty dominate political and popular rhetoric, and individual adaptability is seen as key to success. The shift towards neoliberal rationality in government became more evident in Canada and elsewhere as in the 1990s, as social programs were increasingly presented as unaffordable in political rhetoric, and pressure grew for individuals to manage both their own future success and the risks that they pose to society. Accompanying this shift in political rationality is a great deal of talk about the importance of adaptability in our rapidly changing technological and global economy. In this uncertain and individualistic climate, aspiring middle-class parents, some researchers argue, face increasing pressure not only to anticipate and manage the risks that their children may face, but also to take all possible steps to maximize, in Linda Bloom's words, and perfect their children and give them the cultural and intellectual capital to exceed the norm and gain a competitive edge. The logic of neo-risk rationality itself, I think, creates a trap that's hard to escape. Risk is, first of all, that which is pre preventable. All we need to do to manage and avoid risk, we are told, is to educate ourselves using the latest expert knowledge, make the right choices, and plan accordingly. The future is in our control. Life, then, as Elizabeth Beck Gershheim has pointed out, becomes a planning project, and raising children for success becomes part of this project. Adding to the urgency of this message is the fact that the threshold of what is an acceptable risk in terms of children's physical safety has been increased dramatically through law and child welfare policy in recent years. And Frank tells me that in Canada, we're ahead of, ahead of everybody in this regard. Um, part of the problem with this planning project, though, is that so much to do with having and raising children is highly variable and difficult to control. As Susan Mosshart, in her very good book called The Mask of Motherhood, asks when commenting on all the attention spent in our culture on birthing plans and planning for childbirth, she says, why in the repeated emphasis on control and accomplishment do they ignore altogether what is probably the most crucial factor of all in the experience of childbirth, luck? The idea that things might have simply to do with luck or other things that are beyond our control is a frightening one and one that's not acknowledged in neoliberal discourse. Neoliberal discourse is full of anxiety about the uncertain and risky world we live in, but it promises control over this for those who take responsibility to educate themselves and make the right choices and plans. As risks increase then, the responsibility for parents to make better choices 
and better plans intensifies. The more out of control we feel or are, the harder we are expected to try. Bonnie Fox, a Canadian researcher, in her recent study of the transition to parenthood among Canadian couples, noted that many middle class women in her study responded to feelings of anxiety around what they felt was a lack of control over their infant's health and happiness by parenting even more intensively. This response can also be seen in the following quote um, from Allison, who is, was frustrated that despite her four-year-old's daughter, daughter's ability to count, to know her alphabet, and to spell simple words, was still, in her words, middle of the pack of reading ability in her daycare group. She says, I feel like I have to be providing her 24-7 stimulation. If I don't, she'll be lagging behind the other kids. Linked to feelings of anxiety around lack of control and the need to try harder is the fact that there is no concrete way to measure the effect of parental inputs on later intelligence and success. You'll never know as a parent whether uh, if you have done enough, if what you have done has really made your child smarter and more successful in the long run, or whether you could have done more. So what is the conscious, uh, conscientious, selfless mother to do? Try harder, of course, do all we can, worry that we've not done enough, and feel guilty when you want some time for yourself. Those types of what-if questions and expressed fears that their children may not be all that they could be or may miss out on opportunities in the future were very common among the participants in my study, um, as the following quote from Maria um, illustrates. She's talking about her daughter's friend. She said, my daughter's friend is in dance lessons. She does drama things. They all go to these concerts. She's going to French classes in the fall. I keep thinking, what am I doing? Am I doing the right thing? I definitely have moments of, oh, maybe I should have done that, or maybe. We thought about different schools, and I thought, maybe I should send her to a bilingual school. Yeah, there's a lot of that. And finally, Tara notes that the day she dies, she hopes to have never done never not done something as a parent that I should have done that I knew about, but it <laughs> reflects that, that anxiety. So I will wrap up, I'm running over time here. Um, just in, in, and especially I'm gonna focus in on the risk stuff here. I think it's important um, in challenging the logic of, to challenge the logic of risk and control around brain development discourse. And this means challenging not only whether or not this is good for children and what the costs of it are to parents, although both of those are very important things and very, very important uh, pieces of research. But also, I think, challenging the assumption that parents have as much control over how children turn out in this respect as we attribute to them in the first place. This type of challenge, along with the challenges <coughs> to the underlying assumptions of natural motherhood and objective scientific authority, offer, a more, prom offer more promising avenues of resistance um, than the one that I found in my study. Although many of the women I interviewed were attempting to reclaim some legitimacy for their own needs and desires, this attempt was accompanied by guilt, given that they accepted, for the most part, the underlying assumptions and claims of brain development advice. Questioning um, the assumption of control doesn't lead to individualized guilt, like questioning whether you should have some time for yourself does. And it is also, I think, aligned with a more respectful and realistic view of children as more autonomous individuals in their own right. And I will end there.